guess uh, since it's officially 410, so why don't we get started. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be introducing Carlos Castillo Chavez as the first speaker in the Major Issues in Modern Biology uh, series sponsored by the Store of Life Sciences Endowment this year. And in some sense, too, it, it's because uh, Carlos, in some sense, is addressing today, in, in some ways, three major issues in modern biology. One uh, being epidemiology, and uh, he's got his title up there, so I won't have to repeat it. Another is that uh, Carlos is very much at the forefront of integrating mathematics and biology, which is a major aim. And third, uh, Carlos has played a huge role in trying to uh, keep underrepresented groups, uh, uh, people uh, uh, coming from uh, various Mexican-American, Puerto Rican-American, African-American, women, etc., involved in biology, getting them through to the PhD level. And if you look at his webpage, you see an impressive list of accomplishments there. He's also run a number of summer programs. As a matter of fact, two women in my uh, group uh, first met Carlos that way. And so uh, it's an impressive record. Carlos uh, received his uh, PhD uh, from the University of Wisconsin a while ago in mathematics and then uh, slowly moved towards working more in uh, really uh, direct areas of biology. Spent about uh, over 15 years at Cornell University in, uh, as his technical seems to be there, in a variety of departments which then changed their names. So uh, eventually ending up in, uh, I guess it was biometry, but no, it wasn't biometry by then, it was something else. And uh, about five or six years ago, moved to Arizona State University, where he's now the ASU Regents Professor and Joaquin Cousteau's Junior Professor of Mathematical Biology. And I could go on and on, but I'd like to leave Carlos some time to talk. So uh, please welcome Carlos. Thank you, um, thank you very, very much, Alan, for the introduction. I want to thank uh, the Dean for the invitation that I received. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to speak to, to this audience. I um, always like California, so this is, uh, so, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, some of the work that I have done uh, using mathematics and, and so in the context of influenza and, uh, and, and, and other, uh, and, other uh, and particularly regarding the concept of cross immunity. So, um, the first thing that I want to do is, and it's, uh, it's always challenging to try to, um, to convince uh, such a distinguished group of scientists uh, that mathematics has actually can uh, tell you something uh, unique and different. I know that there are some people here that have made major contributions, but still um, uh, the, the criticality of value of mathematics is always uh, an issue that has to be addressed just like anything in science. You have always to show that what you are doing is some, somewhat relevant. So I hope at the end of the day I can show you a little bit about that. So the first thing that I want to tell you is that prediction is difficult, particularly without data. right? And the, the reason I want to talk about it is because there is a lot of emphasis on thinking of mathematics as a tool for prediction. And uh, so I want to tell you uh, what happens in situations where you actually have lots of data. So uh, I could talk about the stock market, but that's, everybody knows that it uh, doesn't matter how much data you have, you cannot really predict anything that happened except that it's, uh, uh, except after it happens. But, but let me just give you an example where there is a lot of data. That has to do with the... Uh, uh, predictions of um, uh, hurricanes after Katrina, which, why the, which by the way was uh, the outcome of Katrina was very well predicted by some models. People had done models and said if there is a level four hurricane, this is what is going to happen. And it was published in articles and they have uh, complete details of what could happen, but nobody read it or nobody really paid any attention. And this was years before it happened. And when it happened, it just went exactly as, as, as predicted. The consequences were very uh, much in line with uh, what they have done with mathematical models. But uh, I'm talking about because after Katrina, there was a new hurricane that came, was called Rita. And by that time, people always were very worried. And there's lots of data, right? We have um, essentially, uh, we have meteorological data. We had uh, satellite pictures. We have humidity measures. We have stations. We have wind velocity. We have every amount of real-time data that you can have. It was right there, right? I mean, you could, 
uh, watch it, if you were even watch it uh, television. So you have all that about that. And then they were planning what should we do as this hurricane comes and hits um, uh, Texas. So at one point they made the decision, let's move three million people out of here because this is very, very dangerous. Um, this was done very, very fast. A lot of people die in the moving process. And then uh, what happens is that uh, Rita decided to just at the last minute to go in a different direction. So, so the, I'm telling this in the context because everybody wants to know when is the next pandemic of influenza. And I'm just telling you what you can do when you have all this kind of data. And, and I think this is illustrative that I think that the decision that they made of moving people was actually the right one. But I'm just trying to tell that even in those circumstances when you make the right decision, it might actually uh, have unexpected consequences, right? So uh, this is something maybe, maybe your governor wants to make wants to read this part, but I don't know. So <laughs> essentially, is the, the general idea is it doesn't matter what decision you have, you, know, you should make some sort of a little quantitative analysis of what are the consequences of that. And I think that that's, that's a very, very important. And, and uh, in epidemiology, it was studied first by Daniel Bernoulli, which was a medical doctor. It's very, very interesting that a lot of the theory of uh, epidemiology at the study of diseases was, in fact, developed by medical doctors. Uh, Bernoulli one of, was one of them. Ronald Ross, uh, Nobel laureate for his work on malaria, was another one. Kermack was another one. Kermack McKendrick was another one. So a lot of doctors actually have been very, very interested in quantifying and trying to see how they, how they uh, use the information that they have at the level of individual to try to ameliorate or to diminish the consequences of disease at the population level. So the typical models that, that they use is the SIR model. This is probably, a lot of people have seen this now. And, uh, and this, this is so frequently presented that almost people believe that this is the only model that we have. And, uh, but essentially, this is a simplified version so that we can have a dialogue. Uh, you have a population, and you assume that some people have not had the disease, and they are susceptible to get the disease. Some people get the disease, get infected, and they are infectious. Of course, that's never true. Uh, people often get infected, but they don't have, uh, they are not infectious, or sometimes they have asymptomatic and they are infectious. So there is all sorts of complications that we ignore just for the presentation. And then in this case, they recover with permanent immunity, which is often the case for many diseases. For others, it's not the case. In the case of influenza, you get a particular strain of a particular subtype, you get permanent immunity, but of course, influenza changes, and you are not immune to that. So, so that's the general model. And Essentially, it's divided like this. You have these susceptible individuals, and then they move, they become infected by having contacts with infectious individuals, and then they recover. So this is the general idea. And uh, what we get out of this model is that under some conditions, and I think I'm going to skip this slide, under some conditions, you actually get some sort of exponential growth. So that means that if every infectious individual is able to replace then cells plus a little bit more before they recover on the average. So let's say if one infectious individual infects two before he or she recovers, and then each one of them infects two or, uh, before uh, he or she recovers, then you see exponential growth. And uh, that means that uh, you know, this, is, this, is, this is the, the solution. And if this is greater than zero, you have an epidemic. And that means that on the average, every individual infected more than one person. And this is called the basic reproductive number. So this is a very, very famous concept. And uh, do we see exponential growth? And can we actually measure it? In this case, you see this data from SARS epidemic. And this is the data that we actually used to predict how many SARS cases we were going to have in Canada. And as you can see, this is when SARS was identified May 18. So there is a lag. And this is the exponential trend that took off in Hong Kong. This is the exponential trend that took in Singapore. And as opposed to Rita or Katrina, this is all the data that we have. That's all the data that we have. And based upon this data, we try to later on predict what's going on in Canada. So in this case, obviously, the basic reproductive number is greater than, than one. You have an epidemic. And then what the model predicts typically is if it is greater than one, it grows, but it's lower and it's lower because eventually you start running out of susceptibles of people to infect. So there is a limit to how many people can infect. And if the basic reproductive number is less than one, then in some sense, the disease does not succeed. So a lot of the policy or control efforts that people had is how can I shift 
from this situation to this situation? How can I change the system so I go from a situation where things are growing exponentially to a situation where actually things are decaying exponentially? And there is a book about that. Uh, and uh, this is the tipping point by Gladwell. And essentially, he almost understood this concept. And then he wrote this book and became a millionaire. So now he really understands this concept. <laughs> and um, he wrote it in the context of crime in New York City. He assumed that um, essentially, uh, there was during the time that Giuliani was uh, mayor of the city and Clinton was president. And crime was going down in New York. So he read these epidemiological papers and said, if you bring the the uh, population of susceptibles below some threshold, in some sense, you're going to go from exponential growth to exponential decay. You won't have enough people to sustain the population of potential criminals, and therefore, crime will die. And he assumed that due to the efforts of Giuliani and, and, and Clinton, so there are Democrats and Republicans, everybody should be happy here. Uh, then the, he concluded that, and out of this is how little things can make a big difference in some sense, because there is this tipping point, and he has used that to to make a lot of money and explain everything. Uh, so there were other doctors, that, uh, medical doctors that worked on this. And one of them was a statistician and the other a, a doctor. And uh, essentially, they were students of Sir Ronald Ross, uh, the Nobel laureate in, in uh, medicine, that had really done some, some of the most beautiful work in mathematics after he won the Nobel Prize. After he won the Nobel Prize, he wanted to see how can I use uh, the knowledge that I have about the life cycle of malaria to actually control malaria. How can I do help to do policy with that? And then essentially, he introduced mathematical models to approach that problem. So these are some of his students. And, and they develop a single outbreak model. And single outbreak model says, well, we are very interested in the situation where you have susceptibles and infected, but there is no new uh, the time scale is so short that essentially there are no births and deaths. Uh, so in that case, what kind of situation that we have? We have the same model. And essentially, you have a situation like this where you have the susceptibles. They go down. As the infections come out, you have an outbreak, and then it dies out. So this is the kind of models that became important after SARS because essentially SARS was a single outbreak. And in many cases, influenza has been a single outbreak. And uh, this is pretty much what happens with seasonal influenza. And the big question that people have is, when is the second wave coming? When is there a second wave? That's sort of the things that people have been interested. So when we apply this to, to SARS, essentially, uh, we, we find out that, that in order to, to, to really stop the exponential growth, you have to do two things. You have to fast diagnosis, which you couldn't do until you knew what was the cause of SARS. When they knew what was the cause of SARS, they can have developed diagnostic tools. And then you have to isolate people that were infectious. First, people were moving them from hospital to hospital, in fact, spreading the infection. And then uh, based upon this, we were able to fill this, this data train, but only if you apply both of them. So it was an integrated management technique where you had to apply uh, fast diagnostic and uh, effective isolation. And with that, we predicted that we were going to be no more than 400 cases using as our parameters the exponential growth that we had measured in Hong Kong and Singapore. So it's in that. So actually, it was, it, uh, there were 396 cases. So you can see that even though there is little data, then you can actually make some predictions. Uh, this is Gerardo Chávez, my student, which is now my colleague. And out of this work, the Mexican president gave him the National Youth Award and $10,000. And uh, I was in the audience. I was not that important that day, which is great. <laughs> OK. So um, I'll talk a little bit about epidemics on networks, because networks is something that, that comes a lot. It's, it's very interesting. And um, in some t sense, um, when one sees simple models, although the ones that I wrote could be made very complicated, one gets a sense that there is some sort of loss of realism. There is not enough details. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some trend that people do about doing epidemics on networks. And uh, these are some really great papers. This is my former colleague, Strip Strogas, which shows great papers about that. And, and you like the mathematics. The uh, Newman from Michigan State does this wonderful paper in which he not only uh, explains everything that is going, but actually he starts connecting these networks to some statistical work. And uh, that's a very impressive piece of work. So I'm not going to talk about all kinds of networks, but you have heard about uh, some sort of six degrees of uh, uh, separation and a small world networks. And essentially, small world networks is like this. You, you have uh, connections with uh, people next to each other. But once in a while, you have a long distance connection. 
right? And, and this, is, this is essentially what is the probability of, of a random long distance connection. In this case, it's small, and uh, in this case, it's a little bit uh, higher. And this is a hub because, the, in this case, this point has a lot of connections. So this is a way that people try to identify things like super spreaders or uh, traveling professors or whatever it is about, about who can spread actually the diseases. And then you can actually build epidemics on this. You can have susceptibles, infections are recovered, and you can actually build epidemics on these networks, and you can ask uh, questions as to how different it's going to be if you actually put these details of the network or something like that in an epidemic process versus what happens when you use a differential equation model where you actually make more assumptions. Are there lots of differences? And of course, you will expect some sort of exponential growth if there is an epidemic. And this is what happens when you use the differential equation. And this is what happens when you use the small world network as this um, probability of long distance connections increases. If, if, if P is equal to 1, everybody's connected to everybody. In that sense, you, you sort of have the differential equation model. But so you can see that uh, the differential equation model tends to overestimate the magnitude of the, of the epidemic, while the networks give you uh, essentially uh, uh, still uh, exponential growth, but lower rate of growth. But you can ask other questions that you cannot quite ask so clearly with differential equations. For example, what happens if the initial infectious source has the highest number of faraway connections? You can actually play a little bit with the social network and say, what if I actually put it here versus here? And this has been important in some contexts in the case of Homeland Security, and people are sort of worried about what would be the more uh, what the pressure points of our transportation system, the pressure point of our society, what would be the places that we have to protect the most. And you can see that the rate of growth is higher if you carefully place uh, an infectious that if you don't. And you can ask other questions, for example, that we do what happens if you do three sources versus one source, uh, and, and what happens, again, as the disorder parameter. And of course, three sources essentially create more chaos than one source. So you can see that, in some sense, these models give you what you expect, in, in, in some sense. And, but what it is interesting about this is that, um, typically, what you see is, as the number of faraway connections increases, not very much as soon as you cross about 0.1 or something like that, then suddenly, it, oh, I see. This is uh, too effective for me. Uh, yeah. As suddenly, as, as they increase that, then you see a sharp jump in the final epidemic size. In other words, you don't have to be that connected to have chaos. As soon as you, so there is a threshold as to as to what that happens, and you can study this in a lot of in other cases. For example, in this case, what happens uh, for this transmission if you? put the initial infected and the, uh, uh, as, as the person most connected. Again, the, you see the sharp transition. And in this case, you can also look at the final epidemic size as a, as a function of the transmission rate. So the more, uh, the more transmissible the disease is, and so the, 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 the faster you reach a very large epidemic size. So what do we learn from these networks? Well, um, sort of the obvious, yes. Uh, uh, in some sense, if you put more sources, you get worse cases. In some sense, they tend to underestimate models that assume that everybody is connected to everybody. But there is also a sharp transition that says that things are not too different, whether you have a few connections or whether you have actually a lot of connections. There is a, a transition point that it says at one point it really doesn't matter. And unfortunately, that threshold for these kind of networks is, is very small. And uh, also, what happens to the duration of the epidemic? And this has, these are some confidence intervals here. Essentially, as the, as the network becomes more connected, the outbreak is much more higher and ends more much quickly. So, 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 so there are things that you can learn about that. And I'll talk about this because I'll tell you a little bit more sophisticated things that can take and do with networks in other contexts. But I'm just trying. To, this is sort of the mathematical things that had made people think about these questions. And uh, but I'll talk about how the the environment uh, matters. So these are some historical pictures from um, from, uh, from from this book by Pyle on um, uh, how epidemics travel. So, so in this case, the trade from the Russian e Empire to Western Europe uh, was in this direction, and influenza just took a right, and it just went in that particular direction. So that's, that's what the directions came out. And so, uh, so trade, in some sense, uh, promoted recurrent breaks. But uh, from a break to a break, there were some subtle differences. And I'll show you a case where there was a, a more difference uh, later on. But, um, even though you still have the same route, there were some differences. But essentially, trade, movement of people, is the big drivers of epidemics. 
Uh, what about when railroads were introduced? Well, epidemics took the railways too. So, okay. so that's where they went. And in fact, uh, uh, Ravachev and Bayoran, they, in the 60s or 70s, there were some very nice papers where they actually used uh, train transportation uh, data on, on the Soviet Union to predict where epidemics were. And in fact, they were so worried that they wrote a letter that I don't think they published, but there are a letter that I, some editor showed to me that well, they were very worried about the potential misuse of this information for, um, for the release of, uh, uh, deliberate release of biological agent, agents. Uh, in 1918, you have this uh, big pandemic that everybody has heard about, where there were a lot of dead people, the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. And then in 67, 68, um, this is a good example because it shows now that air transportation played a big role. And I want to put some emphasis on this slide because from 67 to 68, you have some influenza epidemic. And then the next year, there is the new seasonal flu, a relative of this one within the same uh, subtype. But now uh, what, what happens, and this is really important, is that even though the uh, airline transportation traffic routes did not change from one year to, to the other, the epidemic did change. And the reason that this happens is that as one epidemic sweeps through the country, the immunological landscape of the country changes. So let me repeat that. Typically on an influenza epidemic, you get about 30% sometimes more of the people uh, infected with influenza. So these people essentially develop, uh, uh, we cannot get that same strain again. And depends on the new strain coming, they might have, in fact, some degree of cross protection for the next strain. This is, we call this cross immunity. If the strain uh, is very related in some sense, then as the new strain comes, it's very unlikely that you will get it. Or if you get it, you're going to have less symptoms. You, things are not going to be that serious. So, uh, so when an epidemic goes, it depletes the population of susceptibles for that strain. So when a new strain comes in that is related, suddenly he doesn't find as many susceptibles in the usual way. So he has to change direction. So that's what happened for the next epidemic of influenza. Even though the same route, you saw a different dynamics globally. So you can think in some sense as the, as the human population in, in, in this country as a big uh, immunological landscape that gets changed right, by uh, sweeps of influenza epidemics year after year. And now in and this is work that was done by Hyman and Tara LaForce in Los Alamos. The, you can actually connect uh, this air transportation data to predict the direction of travel of these epidemics. Not how they're going to change the immunological landscape, but you can actually predict these, these dimensions. So they develop some sort of mobility metrics, which has some sort of network where you connect them. But now this trend of the network is tied in with the influx of travels from place to place. Now you have a, not just one point connected to the other one, but you actually have this trend of the connection based on the traffic flow from one place to the other. And then they use this to, to fit this, uh, this, this, uh, this model to the model on upper respiratory tract illnesses, which are often tied into influenza. And uh, they fit 33 cities simultaneously, and they got some very good fits here, some very good fits, a lousy fit here, a very bad fit here, and a good fit here. And then they start asking the questions why they were. And they say, well, um, uh, Matt Hyman called the Center for Disease Control and said, well, Washington. said, well, they do a lousy job at reporting. And then say, say what about Miami? They also do, but we gave them a grant to improve their system. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's what happens then. And uh, the same thing happened in Milwaukee. OK. And so, so in some sense, you can see that uh, with these models, you have actually high power of tracking now these epidemics at this global scale, so you know where they're going to go. Uh, I was in Vancouver, and just recently we had a, we have a sequence of influenza meetings, and uh, they said uh, that Vancouver was the most beautiful city in the world. So this is Mexico, the second most beautiful city in the world, but you cannot see it because of the pollution. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So, of course, the, 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 I'll tell you a little bit about influenza, but not very much. OK, so everybody probably has read this. Essentially, the big problem with this new strain of influenza is this, uh, these peaks are sort of the mixing vessel. And this is sort of a unique recombinant of three different types. And in fact, H1N1 has been with us for a long time. 
So this is very, very strange for in some, because in some sense, all the previous H1 and 1 strains that we had were from sort of a same family. So we get a new H1 and 1, we should have some immunity to that. But in some sense, this new H1 and 1 is, is comes like from a new family, you know, just Godfather part two or something like that. We have the, this case. And so let me tell you a little bit about influenza. Influenza, essentially, you have three subtypes. H1 and 1, this is influenza type A, which is the one that we're more interested. And this has to do with these sun surface proteins. And each one of these has a lot of strains. And as they have mutations in, one of, in, the, uh, in the H molecule, the hemagglutinin, they generate new and new strains. Now, uh, typically in these phylogenetic trees, they said if, you know, it, the dif if the difference in the number of mutations is very large, then they put, it very, they put them very far apart. But that's a little bit deceiving because it really doesn't matter how many nucleotide substitutions you have, whether you have key substitutions that make you different at the phenotypic level. When in, in fact, uh, as you infect a person, you actually um, uh, uh, can generate a really severe infection or not. And these two guys might be very close, and if you get this one, you get some protection, but maybe not against this one. And maybe against this one, you still have a very severe infection, but against this one, because there was not a key, a key nucleotide substitution, maybe you did not get a severe, uh, a, a, you do not get a severe infection. If, if you get some of this type, you don't get any cross protection against any of the other subtypes, but within here, you can get some, some uh, cross protection. So these are the, the two um, uh, molecules that I talk about, and essentially, uh, most of the changes take place in the hemagglutinin. If you have changes at, in the other molecule, the num numerodize, then things are more dramatic. Those are shifts, and those really generate new subtypes, which has actually happened. So the H1N1 is, was from 1918 to 1957. Oops. And then, uh, and then uh, suddenly, it was replaced by this one. It disappeared. And, the, and then it reappeared again 20 years later. And, uh, and in some sense, this one and this one were from the same family. So it's like you lost a child for 20 years, it comes back, the same thing. And then, uh, and then this suddenly ap appeared and, and replaced, uh, 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 and now you have these three coexisting ones. But as the new one appears, it, it's H1 and 1, but doesn't seem to be uh, really coming from the same family. And that's been that that has, what has gotten uh, people worried about that. So, um, so the question is, uh, uh, what are going to be the consequences of this new strain? What, what's going to happen? There's also consensus about that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is this concept of cross-immunity that I just described. If you are within a given subtype, and I'm going to try to work just uh, essentially within H1 and 1, this one, uh, essentially you, you get infected and uh, you could have severe symptoms, mild symptoms, you recover. If a new one comes back, there is some potential that you have some protection is like a partially effective vaccine. How effective it is, it depends on the relationship between the different strains. So that's, that's essentially what this is. And there are studies. So people have done actually population studies about that. So in, uh, in 1974, for example, they had these uh, strains of H3N2. And what they did is they grab a group of people that have had it. And then they find another group, a matching group, same age, more or less same activities that have not had it, that didn't have antibodies to that one. And then they wait for the new strain to come through the population. And then they look at the proportion of people that were infected with the, with, in the group that had some history with H3 and 2 versus one that didn't have a history with H3 and 2 So it's a population study, very nice population studies. And then they find out what proportion of the population in each group did it, got it, and how, symptoms, uh, how severe were the symptoms. Well, it turned out to be that people that had prior exposure got it a lot less and got less severe symptoms. So the ratio of these two proportions is what we define as the coefficient of cross immunity. So it's a number between zero and one. If it is zero, that means that you get total cross immunity. That means that uh, once you, you get one strain and another one comes, you, it won't touch you. You get one, it means in some sense that you have absolutely no cross immunity, that uh, there is no risk reduction on that. So this is a very simple uh, population measure. And there were other studies that we have here in uh, 1976, and then the cross immunity was around 41%, and there is another one around this type. So part of the interest that I had is, uh, can this inform us on what's going on? 
And uh, I think it would be very simple if, you know, if people didn't think. And so, uh, unfortunately, people make decisions, change their behaviors, and things like that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. that this is a, a more realistic network. This is based on the city of Portland, where essentially they have uh, 180,000 locations uh, on Portland. And they have a million and a half people running over the city of Portland. But they don't run arbitrarily. They spend in Los Alamos $30 million doing some uh, sociological surveys asking people what they did. So they ask uh, Alan, at what time do you get up? And you know, Alan, you know, five o'clock in the morning, OK. And what do you do while well, I take the dog out? I don't know if he has a dog out or something like that. And, and so they, everybody has a little script of what they do every day. And then when they, they put that script, then they sample the population, run it, and then sort of figure out essentially uh, what, 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 uh, what sort of the people are doing. They have social activities and things like that. Uh, and the general idea, the, the way they were using these, these models is to try to determine if they are going to build new roads, where to build them for energy conservation. That was the goal. So it was called transient. But later on, it has been used to study epidemics as well. Uh, so I'm going to show you this. I don't know if I need to do this, but I think I have to go this. So this is, this is more or less how it looks in real life. So this is, um, and so this is the kinds of simulations that they have. They, they know at what time people go to work. You know, Big Brother is watching. They know how much money you make, uh, uh, yes, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so this is just an example of the kinds of simulations that people do to try to determine exactly what people are doing. So this is uh, some, uh, Sara Del Valle sent me this, and she works on uh, some of uh, issues. She's one of the students that graduated from my program that Alan mentioned. And, um, uh, so, so essentially, this is, this is the kinds of situations that we have. But of course, uh, one complication about this is that once an epidemic goes through a city, right, it changes the immunological landscape of that city. So if a new related strain comes, in fact, it changes the immunological uh, landscape where this is going to operate. And what are the consequences of that? And um, that would be hard enough. But in addition to, to, to the natural changes that take because of these immunological responses, there are more problems that are taking place now. They don't necessarily have problems. So this is a, another movie that was sent to me by Steve Eubank, uh, which was at Los Alamos and also working on Epic since now is at Virginia Tech. And in this case, it's an influence epidemic on the same city. And in this case, you have the situation uh, where uh, people ignore that there is a flu epidemic, continue to go in life as like usual. And in this case, 75% of them stay at home. OK, so this is just a simulation that they did on this city with this data that we have there. And essentially, you can see in this case, you have also a big outbreak. In this case, you also have cases. You're not going to escape infection, but in case you have a lot more cases. As the points that are red turn uh, change color, that means that people recover. Uh, nobody dies in this simulation. so. This is, so anyway, so we have this situation like this. And the general idea is what happens when you do this? Well, when you do this, uh, in some sense, you protected a lot of people, right? OK, so the epidemic goes through. But you still left too many susceptibles. So if, if, there is a, if this strain mutates, as it has done going through the southern hemisphere and comes back, right? in fact, um, you did not vaccinate enough people with the standard strain. And, it, the ones that it, and this is the, the current strain is the one that is most likely to be an effective vaccine. In fact, so as a new strain is coming back, if there are changes, the big question is, um, uh, is are the people that we prevented from getting infected this time, are they going to have a more severe consequences the second time? So this is some of the questions. And the reason I'm saying this is because in Mexico, they may took these tremendous measures to do this. And it almost destroyed the economy. And now um, the epidemic has already come back. And now they can't afford to take those measures. So yesterday they announced that they had 4,000 new cases, 800 hospitalized persons. And, and of course, uh, uh, the mortality rate in Mexico is for some reason unusually high. And I think it's a direct co co correlation to the, to, the, to the health system that, that is provided there. But, but that's another story. But, but that's some sort of general idea that, uh, that I'm talking about. So making, taking measures to protect people, that has always some sort of consequences at the population level. You might protect somebody temporarily, but it's, it's that, it's that, it's that the best, uh, it, that's the, the best that we can do. 
So uh, a big question has been about these waves, and typically in all the data that you see, you tend to see typically one, the second tends to be more severe, and then a third wave. But that, that hasn't happened. The, 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 this has happened in a lot of pandemics, but not necessarily always the, the things are, are worse. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what happens in, in Mexico. This is the kind of data that they, that they had. And this is a high uh, level of acute respiratory, acute, uh, respiratory disease responses. This is a medium and this is low. And as they were looking at this data, they, they started getting information that something else was going on. That's the blue line. And suddenly, the epidemiological alert came here when suddenly it seems to get out of the pattern. So typically, when you are studying these problems, and the ideal situation is that you study this in real time, that the data is coming into your system in real time, what you are really looking is not for the standard patterns. What you're actually looking is for anomalies. It's something that is getting out of the range. And if something is getting out of the range is, is that there is a problem. So that's essentially uh, what happens in this case. And uh, you can see the cases of seasonal influenza in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the current year. This is the red. This is the typical year. Of course, this is Mexican data, so we can trust it all the time. But, but you can see that things were significantly different. And uh, in addition to that, uh, they had data on, in this case, uh, uh, symptoms, uh, and I can't quite, uh, I always have trouble reading this slide, suspected cases and hospitalizations. So this is suspected cases and hospitalizations. So they suspected a lot more than got hospitalized. And then uh, this is for different cities in Mexico for all ages. And in this case, they have hospitalizations and, and, uh, 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 and confirmed cases or I forgot, I cannot quite read that, but something like confirmed cases. So you can see that, uh, that this match uh, very, very well. Uh, this is uh, for, from the head of the CDC, which came to Tempe to give a talk there. And this more or less was the epidemiological data. And this is when the schools were closed. And it had a dramatic impact, but gets what? Now there is a second wave going already, already there, right there. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so it's affecting different parts of the country. But uh, a lot of things are happening there. So what happened in, uh, this, is, uh, this is from, yeah, this is from Canada, uh, also uh, a conference. And essentially, in some cases, again, you have also a second wave going in Canada. In some places, even in August, you still have some places where you have exponential growth in Canada. This is, this is the most unusual epidemic because this almost breaks all patterns. Typically, you have the end of flu season in May. Uh, you don't have this problem, but now suddenly it's, it's just like uh, it's all of this out of control. It is in all countries, it in, 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 in summer and uh, in many different places that they didn't used to have it. Uh, uh, the head of security of the president of Ecuador died of H1N1. Uh, anyway, that tells you about that. Uh, but about by age class, this is the other factor. This is data from Mexico again. You can see that there is a very unusual age pattern that we have never seen before. Um, with a lot of uh, very young people having them. There is all sorts of explanation that you might have heard about them. But the fact of the matter is that this has not happened very much. Uh, I work with Hiroshi Nishura and others. And we look at uh, Japan data. So we published this in Eurosurveillance. Uh, essentially, this was the peak. They had this intervention here, uh, May 9, when the epidemic started in Japan. That was essentially when they have their golden week, when Japanese go out of Japan and go everywhere. When they came back, they brought the epidemic and did a spread. But most of the cases were not transmitted by people that travel. And this was the most unusual piece of data that I saw when I saw the H structure. Everybody is right here. Everybody is right there. That was just, just, just very unusual. Now, what happens there? That people say, well, this is great. It's going down. We have uh, done that. Well, now it came back, and now it's almost out of control in Japan again. Um, this is the values for the reproductive number, which is uh, some estimates that they did. And this is what they did uh, in Japan after May 9. It looks that like they were keeping it below 1, but now Chrisley is again way above 1. Uh, this is the values of the reproductive number for Mexico that were estimated by Gerardo Chawel and others. And, um, and uh, again, it's clearly um, uh, doubling time in 6.43 days. And, uh, in some sense, it's very transmissible, and in some sense, it hasn't killed a lot of people uh, uh, on the first wave, but we don't know what's going to happen in the second wave. I'm going to skip that. So the big, the big question is about what's going to happen on the second wave, and we have made all sorts of experiments. I'm not going to show you a lot of them. Um, 
Uh, people that have done some statistical models assumed, uh, have assumed that the second wave is going to be symmetric, that uh, there are some preconceived notions. So we actually did a model using differential equations and uh, use these levels of cross immunity. We play with levels of cross immunity and the severity of the disease. And they say, what kinds of pictures can you get depends on the, on the time of introduction. So what you can do, and I'm just going to show you one because I don't want to spend a lot of time, is number one, that uh, sometimes uh, you can get a much more higher wave. Uh, you don't get symmetry. You get asymmetric solutions. So things are very different, depends on the transmissibility and depends on the cross immunity. Is it more severe and more transmissible than uh, you get a high second wave? It cross immunity is, 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 is uh, very high, which means close to zero. Then you almost don't get a second wave. Uh, uh, unless there were a lot of susceptibles that were left because they were not infected on the first wave. So we can actually study all those kinds of things. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, try to talk briefly about some of the work of uh, um, uh, that uh, Luis Betancourt. Luis Betancourt is at the Santa Fe Institute at Los Alamos. I work with some, have done some work with him on real-time surveillance. But I'll, I'll tell you, um, there is a lot of problems with all of this in the sense that um, only a fraction of all cases are reported. So we have a lot of uncertainty here. Um, I was in Canada at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control, and they told me there that, uh, this was two weeks ago, that they had estimated that 1.6 million people had had influenza without uh, being reported. So that means that they have mild symptoms, and I was very surprised about the numbers because typically you spec on these epidemics in, according to most of these models that you get 20, 30 percent of the people infected. So when you have that we only have so many cases, 10,000 cases, 100,000 cases in, in, in populations that large, you sort of wonder, you know, is, is that the fact that many people are not reporting cases? Maybe a lot of people are having mild symptoms. Now, having a large number of asymptomatic cases, that means people that didn't have severe cases of influenza or, or mild symptoms and were not reported, actually that would be a good thing. That would be actually very good. In mean, some sense that means that they are vaccinated, but it poses all sorts of other problems. Um, so most of the initial cases go unreported, okay? So uh, in fact, most of the estimates that we do in terms of everything that we do is in terms of the uh, severe cases. So that's so, sort of a problem. Uh, confirmed cases only a small number. In, in Mexico, the first case had to be confirmed until we went, uh, it went to Winnipeg, was checked, because actually confirming the cases of this strain of influenza is not as simple as the other case and really didn't have the facilities to confirm these cases. Uh, so in New York City, uh, they had a certain number of cases and suddenly Illinois started having more cases and they asked Major Bloomberg what's, what's going on, you know, is uh, New York City that much better than Chicago? And I said, no, we stopped confirming cases because we're just wasting money. We know that it's H1N1, so why should we be confirming the cases? So there is all sorts of things that are going on there. Um, uh, so essentially, um, so, so these are some of the, the problems that we have there. And, and let me just state some of these results that you have in the outbreak study in Mexico. Essentially, it has already in the midst of an epidemic for months before the outbreak. I, I, I'm not surprised about this. And, um, it's very, very important to figure out when the epidemic outbreak started because if an outbreak of influenza starts, let's say, in December, that means that it has a lot of time to use a lot of susceptibles before the weather gets better, where contact rates go smaller and things like that. Now, so in Mexico, when did it start? They probably in March or maybe even in February. But, but that's unusual for a first outbreak to start. They usually start in November or October. And that also means that as the weather improves, contact rates changes and, and information goes out, that it's less likely that, that you will use the population of susceptibles. And as these strains come back, it changes. Remember, these strains are sometimes different from person to person. So there is a lot of changes that go in this strain of influenza as they travel back and forth from the, from the southern hemisphere. Um, uh, essentially, in the United States, they, they have uh, predicted uh, this case. But many people said that there is more than a million people infected. I think in the United States now we're talking about millions of people that actually had it. Uh, the, the epidemic, of course, it has spread all over the world. It's very strong in the southern hemisphere. And I'll show you some results about that. In the United States, there is no clear geographic parent. You, you cannot really tell which way it's going. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the uncertainty. So this is 
uh, using data from the world, this is uh, the basic reproductive number uh, based on cases, based on deaths for the world. This is for the US, based on cases, based on deaths. This is for um, Mexico, based on cases, based on deaths. Pretty similar, so even with all that uncertainty, and in this case, these are confidence intervals that in the case of Argentina, okay, you can see in the case of Chile, in the case of the Philippines, in the case of Australia. So they actually have computed all these cases in the case of Brazil and even in the case of China. Uh, uh, so, um, so what is the other issues? We, we have also done, with Lisbeth and Kura, we have done all sorts of work about looking at the spread of information and how that affects these issues. So in this case, a particular case, Luis estimated uh, this is the news and online search rise faster but die off more quickly than cases. So this is Yahoo News and Google searches in the US. So how fast does the information about influenza spread with respect to the cases of influenza faster. <laughs> so the basic reproductive number for the spread of information is like 3.2 according to the estimates of Luis Betancourt. So, uh, and in fact, that means that we have an adaptive system where people are reacting continually to what is going on, and that makes very difficult to do any kind of policy because in fact, you know, uh, we are intelligent people, so we're trying to figure out what should we do to prevent infections. Okay. Um, so, so for epidemiology, we need some surveillance systems. That, that's a problem. We, 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 we really have to understand uh, these issues of seasonality. I used to think that influenza came and disappeared, and then, uh, but actually, it always stays at low levels. It stays in the equator. It goes in the south, and then eventually rises and comes back. This is not, not so new. And, uh, and trying to deal with issues of uncertainty, real-time data, and things like that are, are uh, very, very, very important components. Um, so I, I had other things that I tell you, but uh, essentially uh, I, I don't have more time. So I'll I'll tell you some of the issues that are associated with cross immunity and what happens. I did some previous work about cross immunity, and the essence of the situation is that um, if the cross immunity is almost total, that means that the same strain will reappear about 20 years later. So when you see the appearance or disappearance of H1 and N1, it's really tied in to how it changes the immunological landscape of the population. For, for the same strain to reappear, it's gonna take a long time. So it, it disappeared at one point, and the reasons are not clear, but for the same strain to come back, it took about 20 years. That means, and, but on the other hand, if the cross immunity is uh, intermediate, then you see outbreaks that could go uh, uh, one or two years apart, and uh, it, if things are asymmetric, which is more the, the most case, where some strains are more severe than others, then you still some frequent oscillations, and, and you start to see the kinds of uh, patterns that we're seeing now that are almost, at least so far, unpredictable. So, uh, so from my perspective, what, uh, there are two things that are driving this epidemic. It has to do with the change in the immunological landscape, the fact that there is probably some asymmetry in the new strain of influenza that is coming back as opposed to this, not clear exactly why and the fact that people are changing their behavior continuously based on the information. And, uh, and I think that this is, uh, makes it uh, a public policy nightmare to try to understand what it is. But I think, uh, in some sense, it presents a real challenge as to how do we make decisions in communities that constantly adapt, adapt to these issues. In addition to that, we have the, the issues of how we're gonna deal with this. Uh, in Canada, they have about 50 million dosages for the vaccine. It, the studies say that now you only need one dosage to protect you so they can cover all Canadians. Here we don't have that many. Many countries don't have any. So there are all sorts of studies that people had made about that. Uh, uh, one of the students that I have working on my undergraduate program uh, look at the following problem. They say, suppose that we have H1N1 and seasonal influenza co-circulating. She did this in the summer. That's what we have. They say, in developing countries, how do you decide who do you vaccinate or you do not vaccinate? So if they had symptoms, they say most likely they had it due to H1N1, but it could have been seasonal. So let's do not vaccinate anybody that had symptoms, because otherwise that's going to be wasted vaccine. But of course you might be not protecting people that maybe you should be protecting. So then she does some sort of uh, 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 analysis that, uh, that looks at two factors. What, what, how can I minimize the prevalence, right, if I use two policies, vaccination or social, and social distancing? And social distancing, which is mean like closing the schools and this and that, is going to be very, very costly. And the other, the other policy would be um, uh, 
uh, of course, to use the vaccination, but there's going to be an extra cost because there is a lot of wasted vaccine because I might be giving it people that don't need it. When you have, and, and in addition, how do you do this when you have very limited resources, right? And this is the kinds of studies that people are trying to struggle. I mean, in Mexico, they're really trying to struggle to figure out what to do. Uh, I was reading some information about India. I think they have 3 million doses of um, antivirals. They have 1.2 billion people. I mean, it's, this, is, this, is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And the technology pro for producing vaccines um, it, you know, it's, it's so, so old and so inadequate and so slow that, in fact, even, even if we had the resources to produce enough vaccine, uh, economic resources to do that, we don't have the technology to even come close to meeting you know, one third of the world demands. So anyway, so this is some kinds of things where biology meets policy, meets behavior, and um, this is some of the things that I've been doing. And I've been doing this with lots of students, and I thank you very much for your attention. Yes, yes, any question? Yes? My understanding was that during the uh, 1819 pandemic, the second wave through was far more virulent. Yes. There had been mutation to greater virulence. Is that a pattern? Uh, and secondly, why would that happen since there should be selection against strains that are both highly transmissible and highly virulent? Yes. Um, it, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I don't think it's in general a pattern, but it has happened sometimes. Um, but um, but the, the reason is that um, in some sense, uh, if, I, if, if we make the assumption, and, and we have made this assumption sometimes, that the most virulent strain, which is, means the one that causes more severe symptoms, the one that is more likely to kill you, actually they don't kill you, they facilitate pneumonia, and, and, and pneumonia is a big issue, of course. And, and, and we, I was telling people, 40% of us have pneumonia in our bodies all the time. So, you know, so this is a big issue. So, so if, um, so, so essentially, if that's, if that's, if that's the case, what happens is that this most beautiful and my, maybe is less transmissible. So the first strain is more transmissible, is more capable of invading and infected people, right? But in some sense, uh, the fact that um, that uh, that that for the for the less virulent strain, the second time around, there are less people to infect, gives some advantage to the most virulent strain, and therefore they are able to infect more people than than than, than the previous one. So when they go head to head in competition, the less virulent might win. But after the first one had a shot at the population, then it has less resources and might get out competed by the other one. So that might be a possible explanation. Yes, sorry. Yeah, can you tell us a bit more about how far the models have gone on putting sort of sensible behaviors that we know that people do relative to diseases? My, my impression is that the network models still don't usually put in much behavior that is even as simple as the network of connections totally changes, that when people get sick, they don't go to work anymore, yes. or they actively avoid other people who yeah. appear to be sick, and so on. So. How far have the models gone in just putting in those sorts of behavioral changes? <coughs> yeah, um, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, I think if I have gone to several NIH uh, watches that this is sort of the biggest push for NIH right now that I have seen. I have, it's a tremendous drive to try to figure out how can one involve human behavior with respect to uh, HIV, with respect, this is something that they're really trying to push. And, and um, even several of the groups that are that are having this, having, uh, having funding from managers, getting pressured to try to, you know, to come up with some frameworks where they can actually study this. Uh, so so um, there have been efforts in different directions, but I don't think there has been a really good thing to do that. But when it comes down to, to networks, i just tell you an example. Uh, uh, in this uh, Portland network that, that we had, I, I study this, uh, this network, um, and it's an article that appeared about five years ago in, in, in Physica E or something like that. Um, where we actually look at this question. So in the, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning, most people, maybe except college students, were at home, right? So, so in some sense, at that way, the network is almost non-existent. So as time went on, we started seeing the network of interactions in Portland. And uh, two people were connected to each other when they were in the same building, for example. So we started following these connections over time. 
Uh, so uh, so as, as time got later, you know, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, suddenly uh, people were very connected. And then as they go on, they can, uh, uh, first they were separated, clustered. Pretty soon almost everybody was connected to everybody. And at night, um, then essentially the, the network starts to disappear. What happens in this case is that there is no clear mathematical structure. So number one. So you can do it through simulations. But if you look at the scaling laws that occur at each time, they are different. Uh, in addition to that, we, we also look at the, at the behavior of the individuals in terms of um, uh, uh, social activities and in terms of work activities or social and work activities. And we build the networks just conditioned on these activities. And again, the networks change all the time. So yes, this, this network changes all the time. And in some sense, building these models, particularly you have some sort of hierarchical models embedded in each other might allow you to do some inferential statistics, at least to try to see how this scale, scaling loss change over time uh, based on information uh, that is focused on uh, the conditional structure of the network at different times based on different activities. So, so there are some of these, but there has not been a clear mathematical theory that studies dynamic ne networks. And I, I agree with you entirely. That's, uh, to me, that's the drawback of the using a scale-free and a small wall is that they don't change, and we really don't behave that way. Thank you. Alan? You have discussed, and in the conclusions here, some of the hint at issues of economics and cost. So there's the cost that you mentioned in Mexico that, that essentially they use up almost all the resources are in India. <clears throat> there's also the cost that you so implicitly mentioned about uh, surveillance. Yes, sir. Um, how far have the models gotten to explicitly including these costs in ways that might help to suggest optimal patterns of, of response in some sense? The, the, and what one really, well, one approach that really needs to do, and um, we, have, we have tried to do this at, um, at Arizona State, we have something called the decision theater. Uh, and the decision theory is just something like this. And we have uh, screens all over the place. And they have uh, clusters of computers. And the general idea is that if data comes in real time, and, uh, and you have some models, then uh, you use data as data comes in real time. And we have actually worked with the health department there. Uh, we we uh, recompute the parameters and update. So we use some sort of Bayesian approach to do that. And then from there, we forecast what's going to happen. So we have applied this particular to things like West Nile virus, where we have um, a special spread of, and we have a map of Maricopa County, where this famous sherry lives, um, where we have these uh, uh, two ways of West Nile virus. And uh, you have the people that got infected with West Nile virus uh, in one year and then the next year. And, and in some sense, we, we start. Uh, as, as the number of cases come in real time, you start feeding the model, you make predictions. As more data comes in, you correct them, and you make predictions, and so forth. So of course, that would be costly. And the biggest problem that we have in terms of this information is that most of the health departments get all this data, but never they get it in a, in a way that can be utilized, and they don't have the resources to facilitate this data. So one of the important challenges is how to collect all this information anonymously, of course, and, and be able to make it available for people to do this in real time. Now, what would you do with this information, with these predictions? Well, not a lot because if things are going normally. But what you really would like to do, uh, because otherwise it's too costly, what you would like to do is to identify anomalies. If something suddenly is definitely wrong, you would really to identify it as early as possible. And in Mexico, that took the month, uh, the, you know, probably a month to figure out that something was wrong. By that time, essentially, the, the, this outbreak is everywhere, and people are not ready for it. And I don't know if they would have done better than that. I mean, I think they did a very good job with what they had. But you want to identify anomalies so that actually people can react. Even now, as this news wave is, is coming back, you would like to have that ability to monitor the epidemic in real time. Because essentially, over time, you expect the basic reproductive number to start going. The, the reproductive number to start going down, right? First, it's very high, but it starts using susceptible, starts to go down and down and down. But if suddenly there is a big change on that, then so there is a problem, and then you can react. So um, all of this is very, very costly. So what you really want to have is a system that at least can help you detect when something might be really wrong so that people can actually do something. I think that would be sort of the most immediate use that I would see about that. Uh, in general, of course, you would like to have great surveillance systems and so forth. Yes? So, so what about the concept of uh, cross immunity being used to develop vaccines that cover all the viruses? Is that, is that being used at all? 
Y yes, in fact, that's, that's the way they, they, they do. Um, uh, but the problem is that uh, we don't have all the viruses. They change year after year, so you get new ones. But, but essentially, what they do, at least at some level, because they don't know exactly what's going to, you know, they, there is some art in related to this. What they typically at least used to do, they used to do cross-reactivity tests on ferrets. And the ones with, that create the biggest reaction, that's the ones that they used to develop the, the vaccine. And they hope to be right. But uh, some people are old enough here that remember the year that Jimmy Carter was president and they have this big uh, scare about the flu and a lot of people vaccinated themselves. The president vaccinated himself on television and it turned out not to be the flu, but a fluke. And a lot of people died because of the vaccine. Because the vaccine created reactions on people. There's also a risk associated with the vaccine. And so that's, uh, I think, uh, the vac vaccines have been heavily improved from that time, but you know there is always a risk with a vaccine. Okay. I have a question. Yes. So, how, how that, so, so it's been winter in the southern hemisphere. So, how does the wave with this? Are they going for the second wave, or are they in the third wave? Yeah, it it, it really moved very quickly, and in, 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 it was very surprising. It only moved very quickly into the southern hemisphere, and Australia was all over, which is, to me, unexpected. I mean, people are. Although people live concentrated, it's not you know 20 million people. They have a lot of space, but it got spread all over. Um, in Argentina, was tremendous. In, in in Chile, the same thing. So it is spread very, very, very quickly all over the world, really, all over the world. Uh, spread that. Now, what about the second? Wave? Well, it's there is already a second wave going on in Mexico. As I said, you read the news. Um, I just read the news. To September 29, 4,000 cases, new cases, and. Um, this is the ones, remember, you have to do all this, all this, all, all these caveats of, in fact, not having a really good surveillance. So it means that probably the numbers are much higher than that. But what it is true is that they have 800 hospitalizations. So it is already here, and, and it continues to change. It's not like there are, uh, these are clean-cut uh, strains. Uh, there is a lot of variability even in the ones that are co-circulating. So there is a lot of possibility for selecting. And the question is, what, you know, something's going to happen that suddenly one becomes more attractive and gets selected and turns out to be very viral. And my own thought is that it's going to continue to be pretty much like this. It's not going to create a lot of, of deaths. But, but it, is, uh, it is worrisome because it's impacting young people, possibly because uh, they have very strong immune systems and they have very strong reaction about that. But, you know, it's, you know, it's always uh, sad to see... Uh, all the people die, you know, you live your life, but it's really painful to see young people die because influenza is a student at Cornell University that, that died of influenza. And they have, um, they were calling the dormitories, they check all the people. It's just a tremendous concern what happens to young people. This is one of the most important people in the country. So I think that this is the concern about this, is how bad it's going to be. Uh, and for most people, it's going to be okay. Some people will have severe cases, but there's going to be some fatalities, and that's, uh, that's, hard, you know, that's really terrible. Maybe one, one last question. Yes. Um, so with, I'm, I'm really intrigued by Mo's question about the, uh, the virulence of the second wave. Yeah. And is there a possibility that another cycle through animals was involved with that? Uh, you know, this is, this is you know, I, I always thought I knew something about influence. And then every time I talked to the experts, I found out how little I know. So I, I, um, I remember I saw this picture in, in Canada, and uh, there's a work at passing influenza to, 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 a, uh, to a, a peak and vice versa or something like that. And I, I know this big influenza expert that does vaccines and, they, and I asked him, you know, what about this? And said, Carlos, it's so common. It happens almost all the time. So there is constant transmission between, uh, between animals and humans, not, not birds and humans, but pigs and humans. So, so there is this constant co-circulation of strains, but somehow um, this uh, swine flu has, has, not, has never you know, has never really generated this new strain. In this day, it was a situation where uh, you had the reassortment of, of three types that involved some swine flu, some human flu, and some bird flu. And, and, but it, it's always a reassortment. I personally am not too worried about the, 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 the bird flu. I think it's, it's just really difficult to do. But, it, but the reassortment of this uh, via uh, particularly pigs is, is worrisome because it might create, th this, is, this is a good example. Uh, and it's strange. This is a very strange case because it was a reassortment of three things, which I th thought the probability should be low, but, but I don't know. Thank Carlos again. I'm sure. I'm not sure.